The Second Weltkrieg was unleashed on the world, and both the Reichspakt and the Entente were now interwoven in conflict with the Third International. At the same time, amidst the chaos, Russia used this opportunity to declare war on neighboring Iran. All hands were on deck. The whole country of Canada that had just got out of the war in the US stood up and got to work again for a war now being fought on a different continent. Around 60,000 fresh troops were being recruited and trained for combat in Europe amongst many other allies of their faction. Canada's fleet would patrol the Canadian and American coasts to prevent the situation where the enemy would come too close. America, on the other hand, would send in its fleet to Europe to wage war on the open sea belonging to the syndicalists. The image of Central Europe soon shifted towards a total war zone, with many planes dancing through the skies, chasing prey above nations like Sardinia that was responsible for getting the Entente involved on such a short notice. The German Empire, that was no ally of the Entente and neither an enemy, asked for a non-aggression pact to ensure all the focus from both factions would be on the syndicalist countries alone. America was in full motion as well. Many felt they owed a great deal to their Canadian friends and soldiers would fight gladly by their side once more. Even though this war was seen mostly benefiting Canada and France, the Americans inherited a strong hatred for syndicalism after the Civil War. With both factions combined, the syndicalists faced double the amount of men, but the Reichspakt at the moment was crippled with Germany doing very badly in the war. In January of 1940, a strong winter was upon the lands, which complicated matters for both fighting sides. America showcased its overwhelming power on the sea, as it had started to take down British freighters and take control of their waters. Island nations, like Sardinia, were covered in bunkers all over the place. It was as if an entire shell covered their ground. Ireland, that was part of the Reichspakt, also tried to get on Canada's good side by offering some equipment. Ireland stood right on the doorstep of the Union and also had sea forts and bunkers positioned everywhere. To showcase a sign of friendliness, both Canada and Ireland agreed on a potential military access. While most countries were focused on the Weltkrieg, Iran was being torn apart from two sides by Saudi Arabia and Russia. But one should not forget about Japan, which still continued to claim territory from Russia and moving west land inward at a snail's pace. The chaos in Asia escalated even further as the Feng Tian government declared war on King. In Quebec, about 15,000 Austrian troops had arrived to receive training from Canada's elite units. It further showcased a positive interaction between the enemies of syndicalism and the Entente. Ships from the West Indies and Portugal patrolled the British waters, acting as watchdogs for neighboring Ireland. It was Portugal that had bled the most in the short period of time the Entente got involved. Most victims were those aboard their ships being sunk by the British. It would still take many weeks before Canadian and American units would set foot on European soil and chances were likely that Germany would not hold out long enough to witness this. But ships were on their way and most battles were currently only done by the Navy which dominated the European seas in a matter of days. Germany already looked like it was on its last legs. If Germany would fall, many other neighboring states would fall immediately as well, dealing a devastating blow to the enemies of the syndicalists. More Austrian volunteers were sent out to other Entente countries, including Portugal. But also America received its share of troops to train and exchange information directly from the European front. Finland was also part of the Reichspakt and had a few thousand troops stationed in some of the more heavily defended bunker locations in Ireland. But since Russia was also considered an enemy, Finland would have to fight its own war mostly and stay out of the conflict in Central Europe. 
Then what was feared earlier became reality. The Iberian Federation, standing victorious after the Spanish Civil War, had a syndicalist government, but was not yet part of the Internacional. Many people expected a merge, and on the 11th of March 1940, they did indeed side with the syndicalist faction, making them the enemy of the Entente. Portugal halted their battles at sea, and instead attacked to their direct east. This extra nation to the Internacional could mean terrible things for the opposing factions, as now there was a buffer zone between them and France, whereas Germany desperately tried to hold on. By March, the snow had cleared and the French were relentless with their showcase of power. To the east, the Ukraine, part of the Reichspakt, was eaten away by Russia, not able to provide any troops for the purpose of defending Germany. Austria, though sending thousands of volunteers to fight, stayed out of the war officially, much to the dismay of the Germans. In the Middle East, a side that was untouched by the Weltkrieg, Iran continued to lose ground daily to both factions it was entangled with. The initial reports coming from the Portuguese front were positive. With the help of Austrian volunteers, they were able to steamroll eastward, before the Spanish were even able to set up a good line of defense. To divert some attention from the German onslaught, the West Indies assaulted multiple coastal areas, hoping to force France into sending more troops west. Portugal was doing great, but the Iberian Federation showed resilience all throughout the year-long civil war and would not easily give up. By the 11th of April, the West Indies had managed to set foot on French soil. Though they had initially sent over 10,000 troops, they were soon surrounded by a superior French force. But the Kingdom of France also successfully pulled off a naval invasion to the south, and for those few troops who witnessed this, it was glorious. Finally, after so many years of exile, they were back on their home turf. With multiple naval invasions being a success, more reinforcements would be necessary, and Canada and America would send over troops immediately. Despite the persistent display of dominance, the invasions did seem to work, as the Germans were still in the running game. By April 16th, about 50,000 Canadian troops would be sent over to Europe, but it would take more than a month before they would arrive. Portugal's rampage came to a halt as the Spanish held their composure and now fought back fiercely. Together with the help of Sardinia, the Kingdom of France was successful in liberating a few more towns and harbors as syndicalist forces rushed in to counterattack. As this invasion seemed more of a success, it was decided that the Canadian troops would be deployed here. Then entirely outside of the conflict, it was revealed that the Norwegian Socialist Republic declared war on neighboring Sweden. Besides the German Empire, other nations were dwindling as well, especially with Russia on everyone's doorstep. With the Entente dominating the waters, the Kingdom of France successfully made a naval invasion in the north of Spain but they only sent about 3,000 men, and this would not be enough to both hold their taken port and expand. To the south, however, things were going better, though they had run into a blockade as syndicalist France pulled in a lot of men from the east. As a result, it had the desired effect of relieving some of the German troops who were able to push back. Yet in the east, in countries like Finland, Russia showed no holding back as it devastated several Reichspakt countries at the same time. Governments, like those of the United Baltic Duchy and Lithuania, stood no chance to the mighty Russian Republic. Within a few weeks, the Baltic Duchy fell, meaning Lithuania could now be attacked from two sides. The successful invasion of the Kingdom of France to the south did not last very long. Soon their infantry were cut off from one another and taken harbors were purged. This meant the incoming Canadian and American troops would have to alter their course. To make matters worse, because the syndicalists achieved to hold off the invaders at the coast, they could focus once more on the Germans to the east, 
who were once again on their last legs. With the French attacking from the west and the Russians approaching from the east, it seemed that the German Empire was doomed. <laughs>